Open with me in your Bibles to John 20 this morning. John chapter 20. We're going to finish off this 20th chapter. <coughs> John 20, and we're going to begin with verse 19 through 31 here this morning. Now, some of you here today, I know you, you struggle with fear. And if that's you this morning, all I can say to you is there's, there's a message here in this study that I believe is very important for you. Because to be controlled by fear is literally to be in bondage, to be under its control. And you have to be set free from your fears. So I, I really encourage you, may the Holy Spirit open your eyes, open your ears to hear what I'm about to share with you. Because the disciples were men that were totally controlled by their fear as we begin this reading of this text. They are, they are just completely overwhelmed by their fear. And you'll see that immediately as we begin to read. And so this is the record of the second and the third appearance of Christ with his disciples. First to the ten, because Thomas is not with them, and then with the eleven as they are gathered together. So let's read chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now in this section of scripture, basically what John does is... and. He just describes this revelation of Christ to his disciples. The doors are shut, and they are shut because they are afraid. Now, how do we know that they were afraid? Well, John says very clearly here in verse 19, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Why were they so fearful? Well, they knew that the authorities meant business. Why? Because they had just killed Jesus. They had crucified him. And these men realize that he's gone and now they are on their own. And they are sitting there in this room and they are completely controlled by their fear. Now another little item that I think is very important here to notice is this word shut. The doors were shut. Now this particular word Shut means to be shut and locked and barred. In other words, these guys were barricaded in this, this house. And they had the doors locked and barred so that no one could get in. But did that stop the Lord? No. He just appeared in their midst. But these men are in total fear. And they are they're barricaded in this place because they have no idea what is about to take place. They took Jesus. Will they be coming for us next? And so this is the question that they have within their hearts. So fear basically results from particular behaviors, thinking, actions that a person takes. And this is a reality that many people deal with. 
I counsel with people all the time dealing with the subject of fear. So how do you overcome your fear? Now, I just would like to give you just a couple of very simple principles that I believe are clear from this text and clear from the scripture. How do you overcome fear? Well, faith requires you to refuse to be fearful. It's a choice that you make. And that is a critical idea to to realize. It says in Psalm chapter 3, verse 6, it says there, David says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. So here, notice he declares that this is a choice. I will not be afraid. Now, when did David write this? Well, it was when uh, Absalom, his son, had, was trying to take over the kingdom. And Absalom was coming with thousands of men in his army. And he was going to try to kill his own father. And so David says, I'm not yielding to fear. If you go on and you read the rest of this, the context of this statement, you realize that David was placing his faith in the Lord, that the Lord was going to take care of him. The Lord had taken care of him all along his entire life. When Saul was pursuing him for anywhere from 10 to 13 years, the Lord took care of him every step of the way. And so David believed that the Lord was going to take care of him at this point as well. So he, in faith, refused to fear. So faith is basically a choice. Fear is a choice. If you trust, you're going to trust because you're trusting in him, that he's with you, that he's going to take care of you. If you fear, it's because you have made a choice not to believe that. And so it's a simple choice. It's critical. The next thing a person does when they make that choice to refuse fear is they choose to pray. If you want to be filled with confidence and strength and assurance, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that comes through prayer. Paul said this in Romans 8.15. He said, For you do not, you, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So if you don't want to be controlled by fear, you need to cry out to your Father. And He will set you free. He will set your heart free. Now, have you ever done that? Have you ever been in those circumstances where your heart is gripped by fear? I mean, anxiety rules the inside of you. And it's because of some circumstance or what you know is coming. Some situation has taken place and you don't know how this is going to work out. That is when you need to pray. And you pray because uh, you have made a choice to refuse to allow fear to control your heart. And then third and last, fear is quenched only when you know and sense the presence of God. When you know He is with you. Now, if you choose to refuse to be fearful and you choose to pray, I guarantee you, you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that the power of the Spirit inside of you is going to bring that sense of His presence. The sense that He is with you. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, it says, Fear not. God says, Fear not. Which is a choice. Again, He's saying, Make the choice. Don't fear. For I am with you. Do, be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So there is the assurance. There's a promise that comes. But the, the promise is for him to come to help you and to 
for you to experience his presence. So when you know that he is with you, you can have that strength. Have you ever wondered how the early Christians stood in those, uh, those arenas when they were thrown to lions and wild beasts and how they could just stand there? I mean, what would give them that kind of confidence and strength? Well, they were praying, I'll bet. They were crying out to God, and he was filling them with his spirit, and they knew he was with them. That's how they overcame that. So if this is your issue, I, I guarantee you, this is such a simple thing. It's a simple plan. If you want to look at it in more in depth, you know, in my book, Winning Your Personal Battles, I have a whole chapter on the subject of fear. And if this is your issue, you need to overcome it. It's an essential thing. Now let's look at how Jesus addressed the disciples here. How did he deal with them? I mean, this is a, is a demonstration here of the graciousness of God. His grace, his mercy, his love towards these men. There is no, I mean, he could have just kicked them to the curb and said, you know what, you guys can't believe in me, you're done. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He stands with these guys. He comes to them. Is that not grace? He pursues them. And he reveals himself to them. And so he's the one pursuing them. The Lord has pursued you. And if you're in maybe a terrible place today, you may be in a place of total unbelief, controlled by fear or, or something else. And you may say to yourself, gosh, I don't even know whether I should even go to church today. I'm so out of it. Well, I guarantee you the Lord is pursuing you. He's pursuing you right now. He is the one who encouraged you to come this morning so that you could hear the word of God. He is the one who is pursuing you. Long before we ever made a decision to follow him, he was pursuing us. Those people that God sent to you, those moments where he spoke to you, I mean, all were his pursuit of your life. And that's what he demonstrates here. He's coming to reveal himself to these men. And then, what does he do? He pronounces peace to them. Why? Because he's the God of peace. He's the God of all peace. He's the God of grace. He's the God of mercy. And so he declares peace to them. Calm down. That's what he's saying. Be at peace. You guys are completely controlled by your fear. Be at peace. And that's his desire. That's what he wants to do. He wants to bring peace to a person's soul. In Romans chapter 15, verse 13, there Romans, or Paul declares, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in what? Believing. That you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he has come to seek them out and here he pronounces peace upon them so that they can have some hope. He just basically opens their eyes. He says, look, look at my, look at my hands, look at my side. He presents the evidence to them that it is truly him, that it's not some spirit or some imagination that they have. And so he shows them the evidence of his hands and his side, which is really powerful. I mean, God wants to give people evidence to believe. And this is an essential thing. That's exactly what he does here. He gives them evidence, a reason to believe. And so that's what he wants to do with you. Every day, he wants to give you evidence. You know, for those that you share with or are ministering to at your, at your 
place where you work or at your, maybe someone in your family, as you share the gospel with them and they are hesitant to believe, that's what you need to do is give them evidence. Show them the evidence. What does the scripture teach? How is, was it fulfilled? Explain to them what has happened in your life and give them some real evidence, and which is hope. It's hope that he means what he says. And so, as the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he's going to give you that hope in your own heart, and then you share it with others. Now, the evidence that he gave to them was powerful. I mean, he shows up in the room with the doors barricaded and locked. He didn't need the door. And he just appears in their midst. This is a powerful bit of evidence because they, they can't deny that. I mean, they probably looked over at the door and saw it's still barricaded, it's still locked. How in the world did you get in here? There's something different about you, Jesus. What is it? Well, he is the risen Christ. And he has a spiritual body. And he can appear at any time, any place he so chooses. He asks them to look, to observe, evidence. He goes later in chapter 21 and he, fix, he goes fishing for them and fixes breakfast for them on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. That, what, a, what a powerful bit of evidence that is. You know, when we go to Israel, we always go to the, the city of Capernaum, which is on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And there's a beautiful beach there. It's, it's incredible. And we've walked out on this beach, and that's most likely exactly where they had this little breakfast. Because that was, where their, that was their hometown. That's where they went. And it's just an amazing thing to realize this is where the Lord was giving evidence and proof of himself to these men who are questioning. And then he reminds them of their calling. Notice here, he says to them, after he says, peace to you a second time, verse 21, he says, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So what is he saying here to them? He's reminding them of their commission. He's reminding them of what he has called them to do. He's saying, guys, don't let fear control you. Let my peace come upon you. And I remember I, I sent you out to do something, to proclaim the message of the gospel. So he's reminding them of that commission that they have. This is where I believe they were reminded instantly, God has called me to be his servant his disciple, as he has called every one of you in this room as well. Do you realize that you have a work to fulfill in his kingdom? Jesus said this in Mark 13, 34, when he was teaching a parable. He said, this is what the parable meant. He said, it's like a man going into a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. You see, he has given to each of his servants authority and a work to complete. Now you may say to yourself this morning, I, am, I don't have a clue what God has called me to do and what work he has called me to fulfill. Well, I can give you for every single one of us in here, there is one specific work that every one of us will do. And that is the work of evangelism. He has called us to be ambassadors for Christ. He's called you to be that ambassador to this world from his kingdom. And you're to represent him as the king of kings. Now, every... One of us here in this room also has some other secondary work that he wants you to fulfill. And I don't know what that is. 
You have to come to the conclusion of what that is. Every one of you in this room have gifts of the Holy Spirit. At least one. So that you can fulfill that particular work that he wants you to fulfill. So think about that. That is a powerful thing. God wants you to be at work. And that's what he's telling these disciples here. Guys, get out of this room and get to back to work. That's what I want you to do. Get back to work. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. An essential thing for every one of us to realize. So what is that work? If you say, I don't know, well, ask the Lord to reveal it to you. Say, God, what do you want me to do for your kingdom? It was almost the first thing that the Apostle Paul said when he was arrested by Christ on the road to Damascus. What will you have me to do? What do you want me to do? If you have saved me, you want me to do something with what you've done in my life. So what is it? And if you ask him, he will show you. Now, notice also he next commissions them with his power in verse 22. He says, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So you can't do the work that God has called you to do without the power of the Spirit. And these men at this particular moment actually became born again. This is when they became born again just like we are born again today. Why? Because Christ first had to die and rise again from the dead. That death and resurrection is essential and the Holy Spirit could not come into them until that time. So turn back with me in your Bibles to John chapter 14. Remember what Jesus taught the disciples on that last night? It says there in verse 17 of chapter 14, it says, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So notice how Jesus describes the work of the Holy Spirit. Before a person comes to Christ, the Holy Spirit is working with them. He is convicting them of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. He's persuading them. He's putting those thoughts into their mind. He is drawing them. He's pursuing them. And then at this particular moment, which Jesus refers to here at the end of verse 17, and will be, future tense, be in you. This is when the Holy Spirit came into them. And when that took place, they became born-again Christians as you and I are today. Later in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he promised that the Holy Spirit would come upon them and they would experience what's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And they would have power to be his witnesses. Now notice, all of this is a work of the Spirit. It's not some work of man. It's a work of the Spirit. And he's at work in every single one of us here today. He's at work inside you. And the greater and the more you yield to him, the more he will use you. So it's an essential thing. But here he breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit and they become born again. They have believed in him as the one who died and rose again. They believe that. In John 10, verses 7 through 10, Jesus said this to them again earlier in his ministry. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone, and he literally means that, anyone, 
not just some elect few, anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So notice Jesus here says, I am the only door into the kingdom. I'm the only way into the sheepfold. If you want to come in and by me, then you will be saved. And he's the one that uses that terminology, the salvation of a person's soul. And then life floods that person's soul. And they experience that life that he has promised and wants to have, and has wanted to give them all along. And so he pronounces peace upon them. He shows them the evidence. He reminds them of their calling. And then he gives them the power to actually do it. And then last in verse 23, he tells them this is what you're, you should announce to others. He says, there in verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, what does that verse of Scripture mean? Because I guarantee you, I've had more questions about that verse of Scripture than many others. Now, does this, is this basically teaching that the disciples had the right to forgive men their sins or to withhold forgiveness from people? Is that what it's teaching? There are churches that do teach that, that their priests have the authority to forgive sins. But the Bible says in Mark chapter 2, verse 7, who can forgive sins but God only? You see, Jesus forgave people their sins and they questioned who could do that except for God only. Well, that's right, because he is God. And he proved that by then turning around and healing the man, the paralytic that was in front of him. And so the question is, is does anywhere in the Bible, Old or New Testament, does it teach that people of authority, priests or pastors, have the right to forgive people their sins? Absolutely not. It's not taught there. If you meet someone that says that's what this verse of Scripture means, say to them, prove it to me. Show me the Scripture. Where did Peter ever forgive people their sins? Where did John ever do that? Where did Paul ever do that? Where did James ever do that? You won't be able to find one example of it. But what you can do is find that they announced to people that they had been forgiven. Very important. You see, that is probably one of the most important aspects of the gospel message. The announcement that people can be forgiven of their sins. And so how did Peter and John and James and Paul, how did they do that? They laid out the terms of discipleship. They laid out the terms of how someone could be forgiven. And that's what they preached. They said, if you do this, this is how someone is saved. This is how someone is forgiven. So that is clearly taught. Just go to the book of Acts, read the sermons that Peter and John gave and, and Paul gave. It's, it's pretty obvious. This is what they did. Now that's exactly what an ambassador of Christ is to do. So today, our president appoints ambassadors to countries all over the world. That ambassador goes there. Do they make policy or do they announce the policy of the government of the United States? They don't make policy, guarantee. They are there to represent the government of this country. We are to represent the king of kings and the Lord of Lords in this world. And so we announce 
the truth that our king has given us to announce. We tell people the terms of how they can be forgiven. If you repent of your sins, as Peter said, repent and believe the gospel and you will be forgiven. Now, I have done this many, many times. When people, you know, I share the gospel with, they, they say, yes, I want to receive Christ. And I say, now, do you understand what it means to receive him? It means that you acknowledge your sinner. It means that you believe that Christ died for your sins, that he paid the penalty, and that you believe he died and rose again. And they say, yes. And I say, well, then let's pray. We pray, and after we finish praying, you know what I usually will say to someone? Do you know that God has forgiven you of all of your sin? They're washed away. That's exactly what Jesus is telling the disciples they must do. You have that authority to tell people, look, you have fulfilled the terms of what it means to be a Christian. And because you have, this is the result. This is the, the result of your faith and your prayer. If someone says, you know what? I don't need Jesus. I'm not coming to Christ. I'm, I'm going to go some other way. I am going to, I'm a good person, and I'm going to go to heaven no matter what you say. And I don't believe in Jesus at all. Do you know what I usually say to them at that point? You will not go to heaven. You will end up in hell, and it'll be the result of your decision to reject Jesus Christ. Your sins are not going to be forgiven. You are going to be held accountable for your sins. That's what Jesus is telling people to do. Now that is representing the king. I'm telling you, I have seen, I have been to memorial services, I have been to churches where pastors and preachers are not representing Christ correctly. And they, have, they preach this easy salvation. You know, somebody's living like the devil, but boy, you know what? They're in heaven today. And I just, I, just, I just cringe. Because that's not the gospel. And that's not being faithful to God's word. And so they are not an ambassador for Christ in my book. Because they have failed to do verse 23. So it is an essential thing that people speak the truth. And we announce the terms of forgiveness and assure people, based on God's word, that they are forgiven. Now next here, verse 24 through 29. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So they said to them, Unless, so he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. This is a double negative in the Greek. In other words, he's saying, no way, Jose, I'm not going to believe unless this takes place. Verse 26, and after eight days, his disciples were again, were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut. That's the same Greek word, shut, locked, barricaded. Okay? Interesting. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Same message again. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Remember that little phrase. We're going to come back to it. It's the key to faith. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. 
Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in believing you may have life in his name. So notice here, Jesus addresses Thomas specifically. He does the same thing to Thomas that he did to the ten earlier. He pursues Thomas. He comes after Thomas. I mean, this is incredible grace. Now, I don't call Thomas the doubting Thomas. You know why? Because he is no different than any of the other ten disciples. He really isn't. He's, the other disciples doubted just as much as Thomas did. In fact, I don't even still think they are fully believing because they've still got the doors bolted shut. Okay? And so, this guy just needed a little extra persuasion. He was probably a little more cynical, a little more hardened, and he just needed a little bit more persuasion. I was a, a Thomas, okay? I heard the gospel many times before I was receptive to it. And I just needed to spend a little more time in the Word, a little more time just looking at what the Scriptures taught before I would really lay my life down. I mean, I went to a Billy Graham crusade, and I refused to go forward. I'm, I'm not going. I'm not doing that. And, but that night, driving home in my car, the Holy Spirit was all over me. I mean, he, would, he just brought me under such incredible conviction. And that is the moment I prayed. I remember praying, just saying, Lord, if you are there, re reveal yourself to me, show yourself to me, I surrender. And the next day, I was, I was a different person. So I've got a lot of, of mercy for Thomas. And I hope that you will have mercy on those Thomases that you meet. Because you've probably got them in your life, your family, uh, you work with them. Don't give up on them. Jesus did not give up on this guy. He came after him. And he wants you to go after those that are a little more cynical. So he shows up, he pursues him, and he challenges Thomas with his own words and with the evidence again. His own words. Have you ever had the Lord bring your own words to the forefront of your mind? You've said, oh, I'm never going to do that. And then you end up finding yourself doing it. And you say to yourself, okay, I did it. Or you make a profession of faith and then you find yourself denying that profession. And he brings those words back to your mind. That's what he does here with, with Thomas. He just says, Thomas, I was here in the room when you said these things. You couldn't see me. The other disciples couldn't see me, but I was here. Now, that should put the fear of God in you. Okay? And that's a good thing. Because he hears everything that you think in your mind, and he hears everything that you say with your mouth. He hears it all. And you have to come to, the, to grips with that reality. And that's what he's doing here. He's saying, Thomas... I know exactly what you said, and here's what you said, so check it out. Put your hand in. Does he do it? No. He just probably fell on his face and just acknowledged and surrendered, and he cries out here, my Lord and my God. Powerful. Now, does Jesus here at this moment say, Thomas, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. I'm not, I'm not God. I'm not your Lord. I'm, I'm an angel. I'm just an angel. Or, uh, no, 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 no. I, I'm just one of the prophets that have been in a long succession line of prophets. 
throughout time to show men the way to God. No. He doesn't say, no, I'm just, I'm just like you. I'm just a good guy. That's all. No, he doesn't say any of those things. He does not reprove Thomas for calling him Lord and God. Why? Because that's who he is. You see, for Thomas to make this statement and for Jesus not to reprove him would be blasphemy if he was a man, if he was an angel. But it's the truth. And that's what the scripture declares. This gospel began in John 1.1. 1, 1. There John said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. Pretty clear. First John 5.20 We know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Pretty clear. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ. You see, Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. So, this is a pretty important declaration here. Now, what Jesus does here is very important. He explains to Thomas the root cause of unbelief. This is an essential thing. The root cause of unbelief. What is it? It's one simple thing. It's a choice that a person makes. A choice. Notice here in the end of verse 27. He says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. So he's commanding him to make a choice. Stop your unbelief and start believing. It's that simple. It's a simple choice. Do you realize that faith is just a choice? Every single person on this planet has the ability to make a choice to believe or to not believe. That's everyone's choice. That's why anyone can come to Christ and come through the door into salvation. Anyone. So that's a simple choice that God has given you the ability to make. It's a choice. Notice how John de de describes it here in 1 John 5, 10. He said, He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. Why? Because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. So here John is making it very clear again. It's just a simple choice. A person chooses to believe in the testimony that God has given of Christ or a person chooses not to believe that testimony. It's that simple. It's just a choice. You see, unbelief is a choice to believe your own feelings, your own ideas, or the ideas that someone else has taught you that are contrary to the scripture. That's what unbelief is. It's a simple choice. And faith is a choice to believe the word of God, to believe the testimony that God has given. And so we make faith and unbelief out to be some weird thing that is so difficult to understand. Well, I don't, I don't know how. I don't know how I can grow in my faith. Just start choosing to believe his word instead of believing your feelings. Because that's what Christians do. Well, I, I don't feel like I, I can really do that. Well, but God commanded you to take this action. But I, but I don't feel like I really have the ability to do that. You're believing your feelings instead of what God has commanded you to do. Do you see the difference? It's, it's really a simple thing. That's what causes someone to obey is because I believe what he has said. And that means I'm going to do it. 
no matter what I feel like. The best example, I've given it to you many times, is forgiveness. I don't ever feel like forgiving anybody. Neither do you. And you have to make a choice. I choose to forgive in obedience to God's word because he told me I need to do that. And I believe that if I don't do that, then he will not forgive me. That simple. And so it's a choice that you make. It's the key to faith and unbelief. And so Jesus here, now notice, pronounced a greater blessing on those who do not see and yet believe. Why is that? I mean, that's a very powerful statement that he makes here in verse 29. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So is Jesus saying here you don't need evidence to believe? Not at all. Some people have read this to say, oh, you, sh you should just have blind faith. No. Jesus showed the evidence. Here's my hands. Here's my side. Check it out. That's pretty, that's pretty clear evidence, right? But what happens to someone who wasn't in that room, didn't see him for the 40 days after his resurrection? What about us? Well, Jesus said, you're even more blessed. Why? Why is that? Because you already have enormous amounts of evidence. You see, you may say, well, I don't have that observable, empirical evidence of his holes, the holes in his hands and his side. But you have observable, empirical evidence in the creation. Do you realize that the creation that is all around you every single day, every night, is the most powerful evidence that you could ever ask for? I mean, when the Hubble telescope got upgraded and they, they saw 10 times further, I'm telling you, that just explodes somebody's faith. It should, because God said, let that be. And it was. And that's how it all came to pass. And we just get to see that, okay? In Romans 1.20, it says this, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You see, do you realize that everybody on this planet has that empirical, observable evidence that they have every day, and by choosing not to believe, they are without excuse before him. He doesn't need to give them any more evidence than that. He has, but he doesn't need to give any more than that. Secondly, you have the empirical evidence of prophecy within the scripture. Prophecy is something in black and white. God said, this is what's going to happen, and 2,000 years later, it happens or 500 years later it happens, or whatever. Jesus says, they're going to come, they're going to take me, they're going to kill me. That's a prophecy. And a few short months later, that's what takes place. You see, prophecy is evidence. Thousands and thousands of prophecies given. Enormous evidence for someone to believe. The creation and prophecy are the two things that I point people to that I'm sharing the gospel with almost every single time I share the gospel. It's essential evidence. But then you have the evidence of Christ coming to this earth to reveal himself in the flesh of a man. That's incredible evidence. That's incredible condescension. God says, I gave you the heavens I gave you my word and the prophetic element within it. Yet I'm going to come and I'm going to say, you, you see me, you've seen the Father. Powerful. I mean, that is why it is more blessed for each one of us because we haven't seen that and we believe this. 
we believe this other evidence that he has given to us. It's an incredible gift that he has given. And so you have to choose to trust a God that you cannot see because of what he's done, what he's made. You have to choose to trust in a, for a plan that you don't know. You don't know what the plan is tomorrow. You don't know what the plan is next, next year. But you're going to trust that he's going to fulfill his work. You have to trust in the provision maybe that you don't know where is my provision going to come from. You're trusting something that you cannot see and someone you cannot see. That's true blessedness. Now last here, basically John just gives a simple assurance that Jesus did more signs than what he has recorded for us here. John writes and records seven signs, seven of them. Out of the four Gospels, there are 35 signs or miracles that Jesus performed. So John is just saying, there's more evidence, guys. There's so much more evidence that I haven't even written about here. So John believed in evidence. Why? So that people would believe. Point people to evidence, not just your feelings. Point them to the evidence. That is the key. And then the evidence does what? When a person believes, he, they experience life in his name. So John here is saying, this is the proof that you know him. Later in his ep first epistle, he will say, he who has the Son has life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So, do you have life this morning? I, I hope so. That should be the proof that you do know him and you have a relationship with him. This morning, I encourage you, do not leave here without making a choice, a decision to believe. Don't believe in your feelings. Believe in his word. Because every one of us in this room, we have things that are going on in our life and we're questioning, how's the Lord going to work that out? Some of you may be really struggling with, how's the Lord going to take care of this? I don't, I don't know. I don't see how it, this is, this is a hard one. Make a choice when we go to prayer in a moment. Choose to trust him. Just, Lord, I choose to not trust in my feelings. I choose to not trust in what I think. I choose to not trust in what other people are saying. I choose to trust in you, in your word. And, I, and I'm giving it into your hands. Amen? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you so much that, Lord, you... You want to reveal yourself to us. Lord, as you revealed yourself to these disciples, Lord, you want to reveal yourself to each one of us in a new and a fresh and a powerful way each day. Lord, you want to speak to us from your word. You want to speak to us in our hearts. Lord, you want us to speak to others for you as your ambassadors. Lord, help us to be those men and women, Lord, that are being used by you in the work of the kingdom. Lord, I pray that this morning you would, you would fill each one of us as your people. Fill us and flood us with your spirit. Open your heart and just say, Lord, flood me with your spirit. Do you know what the fruit of the spirit is? It's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's long-suffering, it's meekness, it's faith. This is where that faith comes from. Now make a choice to use what God has given to you and release that which you are, you are fearing. 
Just release it into his hands right now. Lord, we thank you that you hear us. You hear us always. You know everything about us. So, Father, we just surrender. You are our Lord, our God, our Master, our Savior. We praise you for what you have done. We give you that all that we are in Jesus' name. Amen.